It is the most desirable car, according to the ad. The steamers were actually the least desirable. Um, and cold days, they could take almost 45 minutes to an hour to warm up. And uh, they had a very short range, shorter even than electrics. The electric vehicles, on the other hand, quiet, smooth, easy to start, easy to master, and no gear shifts. And you can see here, a child can operate a national vehicle. So the electrics were being sold um, not only to the rich and the wealthy, but also as something very, very easy to use. So the electrics have a position on the market that in theory could really take them, take them places, but there were a series of events that happened, and there's four in particular that um, I'd like you to come away from the, this talk with that changed everything. One of them is roads. Between 1900 and 1920, American roads started to not only get a little bit better, but also to branch out. Suddenly you had roads connecting cities and towns that were manageable for cars, instead of being you know, just a muddy uh, highway for stagecoaches and, and other horse, horse vehicles. So while you still have the city, very, very strong and good for the electrics, you have this whole idea of getting out of the city and touring in an automobile, something that the electric was very bad at doing because of its short range. Oops, sorry. The second, spindle top, which is kind of my shorthand for the explosion of gasoline um, in the petroleum industry in the United States. Spindle top from 1901, Texas, Beaumont, Texas, is really the first of the gushers. There were oil wells and oil fields in the U.S. before Spindletop, but they were fairly minor and you needed a lot to, to get some, a good enough uh, amount of gasoline. Spindletop, on the other hand, was shortly after it came in producing 100,000 barrels of uh, gasoline a day. Or here you have, or oil, sorry. Here you have the same area. Um, as you can see, there's a uh, rig almost every few feet. So you can imagine how much of oil or this is putting into the uh, American industry. And down here, I want to take you, your eyes onto something that's going to come back to a couple times. And that's the gasoline prices from 1920 to the present because this becomes very important. The electric automobiles may be better, but when you have gasoline that is now very, very cheap and very, very plentiful, that tends to uh, change the evaluation a bit. So here you have in 1920, actually, it's a little higher and goes down 25 and so, and doesn't start really going up towards the, until the end of the 20th century when it shoots up fairly dramatically, as we all know. Third piece, and I'm sure um, Ford is well aware of the third piece, that's the production line. Ford's production line in 1908 is the, is the one I refer to. Um, that is the, the big one. Here you have a Model T here. And the production line being based on what we call the American system of manufacturers, which is the idea of you have uh, standardized pieces, you have them in a regular way of putting them together. There's a function, a very scientific function of how people put the thing together. So it starts with armaments, moves on to other machinery, and here we have with Ford's production line in 1908, moving with automobiles. A radical change that produces automobiles that are more plentiful and cheaper. Finally, the last and one of the biggest is Charles Ketter Kettering, Kettering, sorry, and this is the same Charles Kettering as Kettering and Sloan or Sloan and Kettering, um, but this was before all of that, and this is the starter. Uh, before I mentioned that the gasoline cars were very, very hard to start, the electrics very easy. Some of you may remember maybe a Laurel and Hardy film or some of those where you see a guy out there cranking the car and cranking the car, and the car, you know, the, the crank hits him in the face and there's always issues. So cranking the car, as you can see this poor gentleman here, was a major setback and one of the reasons that people did not like the gasoline cars. Kettering comes along in 1912, first with his uh, Cadillac, using the Cadillac, but a starter that's an electronic starter in the car, so you do not have to go outside the car and crank, crank, crank. You can actually start the car from inside. So with these four things, better roads and, and longer roads, um, more plentiful oil, the easier uh, to find and, and affordable cars, and then easy to start cars, suddenly electric has lost, at least for the personal market, 
pretty much all of its advantages. But that doesn't mean electrics are not useful. Even though we have the aristocratic motordom pretty much out of the picture by the um, eight, by 1915, 1910 era, you have trucks, electric trucks that are still going strong. And a very good reason for that is that the electric vehicles still strong in the cities, one of the strengths, of course, was they were, again, the cleaner, the easier to start, all of that, but they're strong in the cities. They can go short distances and they can go cheaper. So the electric trucks actually start heading off a little bit and get uh, more and more of the market while the electric personal vehicles go downhill. And who's hiring or who's buying these trucks? Supply companies, um, dairies, uh, butcher shops, anybody that needs a clean, uh, non-smelling, non-vibrating vehicle. But one of the biggest buyers ends up being the post office department. And you see here some of the comparisons. Uh, this was done by some <coughs> MIT students in 1913, shows the comparison of gasoline and horse-drawn vehicles, um, how much more they cost over a year than an electric. So for instance, the half-ton urban delivery vehicle, which would be your post office delivery truck, the gasoline version of that costs 19% more a year to operate, although the horse-drawn only 7% more. <laughs> it's kind of interesting at that point. And here we have, up here, this electric automobile is actually from Buffalo, New York, 1901, the Pan American Exposition. Um, expositions, of course, being one of the best places to show off your new technology. The Waverly, or what used to be the Pope Waverly, I do like the original name of that company, uh, was a big uh, proponent of postal vehicles, and they had a rather large contract. And you can see a line of them here at the bottom from St. Louis. The Waverly Company in Indianapolis was one of the big truck providers and actually used their connection with the Postal Service for many of their ads because if it was good enough for the Post Office Department, it was good enough for your business. Rural carriers got into the act a little bit, but um, it wasn't really that successful for them. For one thing, these cars, electric vehicles, were not meant for the rural roads as much. Um, but also, it didn't matter what the vehicle was. Cars and rural roads were still not making much of a splash. Uh, the roads were just not that good. So uh, even if you had a gasoline vehicle, you weren't doing that well. So RFD, or rural carriers and cars, took a little while to kind of get together. And it wasn't until the 1920s that they started bringing cars onto rural roads a little more often. But again, back into the cities, you've got the trucks. One of the big advantages with the post office department and the electric trucks was the size. Um, they could be large vehicles that could carry the growing amounts of mail. 1913, we have parcel post service introduced, which adds not just letters now, but packages in the mail up to 70 pounds. And it's a very big success. So more and more mail, much larger volume of mail is having to be carried. And the electric trucks were very good at that. Unfortunately, um, as good as they were at that, they just were never really more than a quarter of the market at their height. And by the time we roll around to World War I, most of the vehicles that are being purchased by the Army for the war are gasoline automobiles, and that really becomes the tipping point for commercial vehicles. Everything comes back being gasoline. And the 30s and 40s and 50s, I just a quick story for the post office department, uh, electrics are gone. There is no electric vehicle in the postal service in this era. But uh, they do have the, the gasoline trucks. Fords here, much of it, the Ford vehicles from the 1920s, early 30s, actually end up using them into the 1950s because during the Depression and then during World War II, the post office department didn't have any money to buy new trucks. So they ended up using these trucks for 30 years, for some of them. And this is a story we actually tell out in our atrium in the on the road section. So if you want to learn more about that, you can go there. But, you know, gas prices start to shoot up again. We all know the oil embargo in the 70s. But even before that, there were issues about maybe trying to bring the electrics back in. And one way of trying to bring them back in was the idea called the Mailster. The Mailster was a three-wheeled vehicle that letter carriers were put into to make their daily rounds. And this was an idea that came because 
mail volume after World War II had grown so significantly that carriers really needed a little bit more help to get their stuff out, to get the mail out on a, on a daily basis. So the idea was, let's put them behind cars, let's give them vehicles. And the Mailster was the, the first really large scale one they tried with. And they asked uh, first the Cushman and then Highways Products to come up with the electric Mailster vehicles. And they did, but they really, quite honestly, the Mailster itself was a bad idea. So even the gasolines weren't working that well, the carriers hated them. They tended to tip over, they never really went that fast. Uh, uh, one guy said the fumes were killing him, and all, all every problem in the sun with the Maelsters. So the electrics, they weren't as good as the gasoline, and the gasolines were not good. So the electrics tended up to, ended up just pretty much dying. This one here in the far corner is actually the one we used to have on display here. It's our West Coast Maelster. It is a gasoline version. But I wanted to give you kind of a, a color image of one. Uh, 1970s, our oil embargo, now we're really, again, serious about trying to conserve and, and go electric. But again, we're not finding anything that's going to work long term. We have the comp to car, which I just absolutely love. Um, there was a uh, civilian version of this as well, but uh, they, they just didn't work out for a lot of different reasons. And the company ended up going bankrupt. Uh, we have over here the, I love the, the Electra 007 which um, you can see the batteries that are used for that car. But again, nothing that really ended up working. It just doesn't have the power, doesn't have the range. And, uh, you know, it's a test that just doesn't pan out. But then we get into the 21st century, actually the late 20th century, and we're trying again. And I'm going to leave it to someone else to talk about uh, the postal vehicles of, of the new age and, and what they're doing. But just to keep you, you know, informed of some of the different ones that are out there that you'll probably see around and the fact that the Postal Service is not giving up, even after the mail stir, even after the comp to car, um, to kind of bring back electrics into the, into the service again. Thank you.